good evening ladies and gentlemen i am uh, dr birappa professor and head of the department of uh, surgical gastroenterology at nizam institute of medical sciences hyderabad i have been working in this institution for the last 30 years after my post graduation from government medical college mysore karnataka so i joined here as a senior resident and now i am heading the department of surgical gastroenterology the topic for today's webinar is uh, interventions in acute pancreatitis in 2020 so the speaker is a nun under than a famous a world famous a surgeon chief of surgical gastroenterology at asian institute of gastroenterology hyderabad is dr g v rao dr g v rao is the director chief of surgical gastroenterology minimally invasive surgery and liver transplantation at asian institute of gastroenterology i would like to say few words about asian institute of gastroenterology which has started way back in 1990 i suppose and it has grown up into a world best ga center in 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 hyderabad lot of interventions happen at asian institute of gastroenterology endoscopic as well as a surgical interventions it's very well known worldwide and and credit goes to dr g v rao and his chairman nan other than naish reddy garu so brief about dr g v rao it takes nearly one hour to explain about g v rao but i make it very simple he did his graduation from usmania medical college again one of the oldest and famous medical college in hyderabad telangana region he did post graduation from bangalore medical college and later he did an specialization in gi surgery from madras he underwent training in various centers in all over the world he had an exposure in in gi surgery a laparoscopy in hong kong prince of wales hospital hong kong he worked in st mark's hospital london he worked in king's college london as a ga surgeon he has various honors for his credit and awards many many awards as uh, given to him he has been received honorary fellowships from philippine society of surgeons honorary fellowship from egyptian society of laparoscopic surgeons honorary fellowship from pendulum surgical society and also from the royal college of surgeon physicians of glasgow frcs and he delivered various lectures must be more than 100 lectures he delivered in various national and international conferences published more than more than 100 publications in various journals he has done a lot of uh research and publications also especially in in pancreas he has developed uh his own techniques in the treatment of uh, patients with an acute pancreatitis as well as in other surgeries he is a recipient of jc award an outstanding young scientist award in 1994 and 1996 the young person award for paper titled laparoscopic assisted endoscopy at asia pacific congress on gastroenterology tokyo japan and also received best paper award in 1998 and laparoscopic endoscopy in the 7th world congress endoscopic surgery at italy rome and also best paper award and laparoscopic management of liver hydatids at 8th world congress on endoscopic surgery new york united states of america and he also received an award for an a paper on pervoral transgastric endoscopic surgery at digestive week new orleans usa and he delivered many orations to say few he delivered nbk ready oration in 2004 tata memorial oration in 2005 at tata center cancer center hospital and dr dilip kasurkar memorial oration in 2008 pune surgical society he also delivered Francisco Roman oration Philippines on notes and he delivered keys oration in USA Subramanian oration 2009 KSA at 
at Madurai and uh, PNB Sharma oration in 2010, Vizag Pentex oration in 2010, and DS Rangaswamy Rangacharya Research Endowment Award in 2010. For his credit, he has various publications, very important to know, a lot of publications and research published in various uh, journals. Few name few of the articles, especially on a chronic pancreatitis. There was an, a, a randomized control study from AAZ and uh, the combined ESW versus endoscopic treatment for a pain in chronic pancreatitis. There are various papers are published, like is it safe to perform ERCP in decompensated cirrhosis, ESWL for pancreatic alkali, first from Asia, more than 5,000 patients. There were some clinical trials conducted at Asian Institute of Medical Sciences. His pet uh, research is islet cell transplantation, the Indian perspective, and radical laparoscopic radical anti-grade modular pancreatic hospitalectomy. All these papers have been published in various journals in the in the index journals in the world. And uh, to name again, he has written a chapter on pancreatic necrosectomy. Seems to be his main interest even in the pancreas and acute pancreatitis and management of pancreatitis. As you know, that today the management of pancreatitis is it's a still an, a compounding a challenge, clinical challenge for a surgeon. Acute pancreatitis needs multimodality treatment. There is paradigmal shift from an aggressive surgical approaches to a minimal invasive or minimal interventions nowadays. For example, in 18, 1980s, when I was in a senior resident, we used to do an aggressive surgical management for the acute necrotizing and pancreatitis. But things have changed now. Now, the people are doing lesser, 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 and later, later and lesser interventions in acute pancreatitis. For example, the aggressive management has taken a back seat. Aggressive conserv conservative management has taken a front seat in the management of acute pancreatitis. Maybe because of better interventional radiologist, maybe because of better endoscopic procedures, maybe because of better radiological uh, investigations like a CT scan, MRI, endo -ES. So, So the less aggressive and later management have definitely improved outcomes in acute pancreatitis. We'd like to know from Dr. Jivira. So the interventions, the topic for a discussion today is the interventions in acute pancreatitis 2020. Is there a role for a surgical intervention? So if there's an inter intervention, what kind of interventions? Is it surgical intervention? Is it a minimal intervention? If it's minimal intervention, is it an endoscopic intervention? Is it a percutaneous intervention or laparoscopic intervention? We would like to know. I'm sure Dr. G. V. Rao is the is the best person in the country to address and enlighten us on this topic. Thank you very much. I finally thank ASI and uh, and uh, LDM uh, for, for uh, giving us this opportunity. Thank you very much. Over to Dr. G. V. Rao. Good evening. At the outset, let me thank the entire executive of the Association of Surgeons of India for the honor bestowed on me to do this uh, live webinar on interventions in acute pancreatitis. My thanks to Dr. Birappa, head of the Department of Surgical Gastroenterology at Nizam Institute of Medical Sciences, Hyderabad, who has agreed to chair the session. And my special thanks to Dr. Shivram, who has been coordinating this digital CME program. In the next 30 to 40 minutes, I'll be talking about the interventions in acute pancreatitis in 2020. And we just see what are the evidence that we have in uh, acute pancreatitis, what are the various interventions that we do, and what are the practices that are practiced around across the globe, what are the compliances to this, and what should be practiced uh, in different parts of the world and uh, different parts of the country based on the expertise and uh, 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 equipment that you have uh, in different uh, parts of the world. Acute pancreatitis in 2020, the management options 
are variable and different specialities are involved in the management of acute pancreatitis. Acute pancreatitis is one of the most commonest admissions to the ICU and critical care and is associated with significant morbidity and mortality. Most of the literature is focused on drainage and debridement techniques and technology with improved morbidity and mortality. Surprisingly, there is little that is talked about critical care. There seem to be some disconnect between critical uh, specialities which are responsible for the continued morbidity and mortality and there is a lot of importance that is stressed on critical care for the in the management of patients with acute pancreatitis. Now, the eight fundamental steps that are revised according to this pancreat acronym, actually most of the postgraduates can remember this actually. We talk about P for perfusion, A for analgesia, N for nutrition, C for clinical classification, R for the radiological imaging, uh, ERCP interventions during acute pancreatitis, A for antibiotic usage in uh, acute pancreatitis and S for surgery, interventional radiology or endoscopic procedures that are done. But we have to rem remember that the backdrop of this, the critical care is the most important thing in this entire uh, phase the patient goes through in acute uh, pancreatitis. Now let us just go through some of the fundamental steps uh, of this uh, management of acute pancreatitis. The P perfusion goal, we should be able to reach a CVP of 12 to 15 millimeters of mercury and an urinary output of 0.5 to 1 ml per kg per hour and an IVC collapse index of greater than 48 percent. So this is the perfusion goal we should be able to achieve. Analgesia, it is usually multi-model, systemic or combined pharmacological agents and sometimes we will be using epidural block to treat uh, this patient to have severe pain during this period of acute pancreatitis. Nutrition is very, very important. Enteral, there is a lot of data to show that enteral feeding is the best. Enteral feeding in gastric or post-gastric pyloric position uh, is absolutely very essential by the placement of an NJ tube or an NSO jejunal tube. Parental nutrition works best in difficult cases to achieve the individual total caloric value. Whenever you are not able to maintain this by enteral nutrition, we can supplement this with parental nutrition. Clinically, these patients are classified as mild, moderate and severe pancreatitis according to the revised advanced uh, criteria. Most of you are aware of this. Uh, the CT scan is best performed on the fourth day for prognosis and to modify the treatment uh, protocols or the treat modify the management protocols during this period, uh, management of acute pancreatitis. ERCP is one of the modalities to treat any emergencies during acute pancreatitis, especially gallstone pancreatitis, patients with cholangitis, unpredicted clinical course and and ascending jaundice. These are the indications for ERCP in patients with acute pancreatitis. The only rationale for using antibiotics is documented uh, pancreatic infection. There is some role to show that antibiotics have some role in extra pancreatic infection. But for pancreatic infection, the only rationale is whenever we have a documented evidence of pancreatic infection, we can start using antibiotics. Now, surgery, interventional radiology and endoscopic are the three modalities that are used to intervene for any consequences or the sequelae of acute pancreatitis in this patient. Now the dogma is represented by three Ds. You delay the treatment as much as possible, you drain the infected fluid and debride. Uh, the preferred method is as far as possible minimally invasive procedure which follows, uh, allows for gradually more invasive procedures when the previous treatment fails. So in 2020, it is always essential that we follow a sequence, a step up approach from minimally invasive to maximally invasive procedures. To summarize this, I will just show you in a cartoon just to show we have to delay as much as possible and you drain the infected fluid, debride as much as possible and I will add two more Ds to this. If you deviate from any of these protocols, invariably you end up with increased mortality in these patients. So these five Ds seem to be very, very essential in the entire course during which the patient is admitted in the hospital from the time of acute pancreatitis to any interventions that we do. Now we have this acute pancreatitis, basically it is interstitial edematous pancreatitis. Less than four weeks, this patient, the peri, they are called as acute peripancreatic fluid collection. And once it crosses four weeks, these interstitial edematous pancreatitis end up as pancreatic pseudosis. Now we have this necrotizing pancreatitis on the other side less than four weeks they are called as acute necrotic collections and more than four weeks they are called as wall of pancreatic necrosis. Just to do, show you the cartoon depiction of the same, uh, the evolution of peripancreatic fluid collections, acute pancreatitis, now this is what pancreatic dis ductal disruption, 
and then we have the necrotizing pancreatitis. After four weeks, this becomes a pseudocyst, and this becomes pancreatic necrosis, which is called as walled off pancreatic necrosis in current day clinical practice. Now, Todd Barron is a gastroenterologist, endoscopist par excellence. He is the person who created this term called as walled off pancreatic necrosis or walled off necrosis. This is basically an endoscopic definition. So, basically, what it means is Whenever there is fluid, it is called as pseudocyst, and whenever there is some amount of debris, it is called as walled off pancreatic necrosis. So, in 2020, if you see most of the endoscopic interventions or most of the interventions seem to be based on endoscopic ultrasound, and endoscopic highly sensitive to detect even small amount of debris that we see. Uh, uh, see, and so the conversion rate is very very high. So, what I mean to say is, some of the pseudocysts that we see on CT scan could be endos endoscopic ultrasound wands. So, most of the wands in endotherapy C series are CD CT pseudocysts because current day endoscopic practice is purely based on endoscopic ultrasound. So, it is likely that some of the CT pseudocysts are being tre are treated as endoscopic ultrasound walled off necrosis. Now, in current day clinical practice, the question that is repeatedly asked is are they no non wands? In the sense, what I am saying is what about non walled off pancreatic necrosis? See, we have this uh, necrosis that extends into the paracolicutters, the right and the left paracolicutters, sometimes it extends into the mesentery pelvis, and it can always extend into the media senum. Now, for these, the term uh, initially we used to use a term called pancreatic necrosis. Now, because with the advent of walled off necrosis, this pancreatic necrosis term uh, seems to be becoming obsolete, but the term that is used for this extended necrosis is extended walled off pancreatic necrosis. So, very clear walled off necrosis in relation to the stomach of duodenum and we have extended walled off pancreatic necrosis that is beyond the stomach and duodenum in the paracolic gutters, in the pelvis or in the media sternum. We have to understand that uh, almost about uh, three decades, uh, more than two centuries now the and all the management concepts. Uh, seem to have evolved from surgery. All the peripancreatic fluid uh, uh, collection, the management concepts have evolved from surgery. And surgery has been the gold standard for management of peripancreatic fluid collections across the globe. Now, like at, let us look at so, uh, some of the uh, uh, principles that evolved over surgery. Now, we all know that once the patient has got infected pancreatic necrosis, the mortality goes up. So, we have a patient with infected pancreatic necrosis, the uh, mortality is about 30 percent. Whenever we have infected pancreatic necrosis with septic complications, the mortality goes to 80 percent. And if you have infected pancreatic necrosis with multi organ failure and, and you still continue to treat this patient conservatively, the mortality is almost 100 percent. Now, when do we intervene in this patient with peripancreatic fluid collections? There is a lot of surgical data to show that. If you intervene less than two weeks, the mortality is very high. So, there is very, very clear evidence that you should not intervene in early patients in these patients with acute pancreatitis. And there is a beautiful perspective randomized control trial which is published, which shows that if you go in early and intervene in this patient, the mortality is very high 56 percent versus 27 percent when there is delayed intervention. Now, it is ideal that you delay this intervention for at least four weeks from the onset of acute pancreatitis, basically because we have to, there should be a proper demarcation of pancreatic and peripancreatic necrosis. This decreases the risk of bleeding, whichever type of intervention that we do, and it minimizes uh, surgical related lot of vital tissue whenever we do this deprivement. The therapeutic approach should be the drain as much of the infected fluid as possible, and you should be able to mechanically remove as much of necrotic tissue as possible. Now, there is a component called a sterile necrosis. Sterile necrosis without organ failure. Now, some of these patients can be managed conservatively. You have no infection, no organ failure. This patient can be managed conservatively. But sterile necrosis with organ failure, these have poor outcome with both surgical and conservative treatment. Now, a select group of these patients with sterile necrosis may require intervention. What are the indications for walled up pancreatic necrosis in, in 2020? Infection, organ failure, intractable pain, gastric outlet obstruction, a disconnected duct are the uh, indications for intervention in all of pancreatic necrosis. So, we all uh, know that surgery has been the gold standard across the globe. 
Now, in 2020, we have this paper which was published, a step-up approach of the Panther trial, which is published in NEJM, which showed that a step-up approach, in the sense you put a pigtail catheter, drain it, and subsequently you do a small incision, and then you do a video-assisted necrosectomy. So, this step-up approach, which was published in 2010 in NEJM, you can see this is the this is the Panther trial. And this is a very small series that uh, have compared open necrosectomy with the step up approach. And they have concluded that step up approach is absolutely superior to conventional open necrosectomy. Now, this paper that published in 2010 seems to have changed the entire management of patients with acute pancreatitis. And people have switched over from uh, open necrosectomy to uh, a step up approach. Now, this Though it's a small group of patients, now they have published this in 2019. They have published the long term uh, uh, follow up of these patients and they continue to state that there is uh, no difference in recurrent or chronic pancreatitis in patients. Uh, these patients did well. Uh, there is less trend towards uh, endocrine insufficiency and the quality of life, of course, are less in these patients who are undergoing a step up approach. Now, but this, uh, as far as compliance is concerned, most of the centers seem to have switched over to this. But if you see this beautiful meta-analysis, which is published in 2019, actually very recently we have this uh, meta-analysis that is published, which shows that though there is lot of talk about this type of approach, uh, with lot of evidence that I will show you subsequently, it is shown that both endoscopic interventions and surgical interventions, be it be open or minimally invasive, seem to be preferable over percutaneous intervention. Uh, this is a meta-analysis, this has just recently come in to show that this percutaneous approach is a valid approach, but it has to be in select group of patient. It is not that it can be uh, the only treatment option that is uh, that we offer for these patients with wall of pancreatic necrosis. So this Panther trial, which came in NGM, which was uh, a step up approach by the radiologists and the surgeons together, this has created endoscopy stent and change in, uh, because the endoscopy started doing this procedure. And in addition to the interventional radiology procedures, umpteen number of centers across the globe started becoming very aggressive endoscopically and endoscopic has become one of the modalities to treat these patients with wall of pancreatic necrosis. So, we have surgery, we have interventional radiology, we have endoscopy. So, in 2020, world of pancreatic necrosis either can be treated by interventional radiology, endoscopy or surgery. And when it comes to surgery, it can be either open, laparoscopy or retroperitoneoscopy. Let us see the all these uh, interventions that we do in 2020 and see the pros and cons of each of these interventions and see what is the best practices that can be practiced in 2020. Now, initially, uh, endoscopy, uh, it used to be a, a direct endoscopic necrosectomy. They used to uh, dilate the thing and then uh, between the gastric wall and the wall of necrosis and subsequently do a necrosectomy. Now, this unfortunately had a significant 6% mortality and lot of complications associated with this. And there are complications like this bleeding which can occur, which can sometimes be controlled with endoscopy. And sometimes when there is not good approximation between the stomach and the wall of necrosis, you can see that both the stomach and the wall of necrosis get separated. And then these are the patients which present with massive pneumoperitoneum and require some sort of surgical intervention. And these patients can have infection or sometimes the possibility of an air embolism. So what has happened was uh, because of these limitations of the practice, these newer stents came into clinical practice. These are called as lumen opposing metallic stents that have come into clinical practice. Various stents are available in clinical practice. Nagi stent is made from India, Axio stent and the Spaxa stent. Now, and there is not of evidence that has come in after the introduction of this lumen opposing stents. This basically opposes the wall of necrosis wall and the posterior gastric wall. And there's a lot of evidence to show that these lumen opposing stents are superior to the original stent that we used to use and the plastic stent that were used in initial practice. So in the current day clinical practice, endoscopic intervention of walled off necrosis is usually done with lumen opposing uh, metallic stents. And there is a lot of data to show. This is the paper published from our own side, which showed that 
lot of this peripancreatic fluid collections, be it be pseudocysts or walled up necrosis, can be very effectively treated using this lumen opposing uh, metal stents. So, as in today, uh, till 2019 or early 2020, there is lot of evidence to show that lumen opposing stents are the best stents to use to treat uh, walled up necrosis. But there is one meta analysis which has just come in. Uh, uh, I do not know how much of uh, value we have to add to this, but it is shown to uh, this uh, walled meta analysis shows that uh, there is no difference in technical taxes or adverse even traits of drainage based on peripancreatic fluid collection type or the stent used. So, we just have to wait for some more data to see whether the original plastic stents can be still be used endoscopically to treat this patient with walled up pancreatic necrosis or it has to be only lumen opposing stent. But as of today, all walled up pancreatic necrosis treated endoscopically are treated using a lumen opposing metallic stent. Now, let us see at the data that we have that compares the endoscopy and surgery. Now, this is the Dutch pancreatitis study that showed which compared endoscopic transgastric versus surgical necrosectomy. Let us be very clear, the endoscopic transgastric is basically walled off necrosis which are in relation to the stomach or the duodenum and surgical necrosectomy is all these patients which have got this extension to the paracolic area, pelvis or into the mediastinum. And this they showed that the complication rate, the, uh, the fistula rate is slightly higher in patients undergoing surgical group obviously basically because these are the patients who are being treated with drains obviously the uh, pancreatic fistula rate is higher and these are the patients who have got extension to paracolic gutters and mediastinum but this paper shows that endoscopic intervention can be done and this is the one which shows that uh, transgastric intervention walled up necrosis in relation to stomach and duodenum can be effectively treated endoscopically and again this tension trial which came in which compared uh, endoscopy with surgical step up approach again which showed there is some superiority of uh, endoscopic approach in form of uh, post op pancreatic fistula, hospital stay and the cost basically again because you are comparing walled off necrosis in relation to stomach which can be very effectively drained into the stomach versus uh, 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 extra uh, uh, pancreatic extension to the paracolic gutters, medius and more into the pelvis. And there is uh, editorials, papers that are coming in literature to show that endoscopic intervention is one of the modalities to treat uh, this patient of walled of pancreatic necrosis. But there are a lot of limitations on the endoscopy side, especially there is a myth. People believe that uh, whenever we do this gastric dilatation, the gastric juice goes into the retroperitoneum and aids in the clearance of necrosis. And various agents are used, hydrogen peroxide, putting in an asocystic drain to clear this debris. But there is a limit to amount of uh, necrosectomy that can be done endoscopically. Uh, our own data from our patient which shows we are talking about an endoscopic step up approach for these patients with wall of necrosis. You can see this, this is the data from our center. We have a huge uh, uh, set of patients who have undergone these interventions and if you can see this, majority of these patients did not require any intervention beyond placement of a lumen opposing uh, metallic stent. 75 percent of these patients we just placed the metallic stents and they did absolutely well. So, they did not require any uh, uh, necrosectomy. Obviously, these are the patients who have very minimal amount of debris uh, so that it just drains off spontaneously and you do not require any intervention. Now, the other 25 percent of the patients who did not do well with this just placement of the stent are the patients who went for subsequent interventions in the form of declogging. I will show you what declogging is. And then patients who did not respond to declogging underwent placement of a nasocystic drain and patients who did not do well with this underwent direct endoscopic necrosectomy. So, you can see this 75 percent of the patients underwent just placement of the stent and they did extremely well and only very small percentage of these patients underwent necrosectomy. What I mean by declogging is once you put this lumen opposing stent like this, this necrosum gets it blocks this stent and you just declog this stent, these patients do well and the patient does not do well with this. We then we put a nasocystic drain and irrigate with hydrogen peroxide and patients who do not do well with this, a very small percentage of these patients, we do a direct endoscopic necrosectomy wherein we go with an endoscope into the wall of necrosis and using basket snares, we do this debridement. So, you can see this, this is the data. 75 percent of the patient did well with an index procedure 
and patients who did not do well underwent a step up approach and only a very small patient percentage of patients required direct endoscopic necrosectomy. But if you can see this, if you follow the step up approach, almost 96% of these patients seem to have done well. So these are patients who have walled up necrosis in good approximation to the posterior wall of the stomach or to the duodenum. Now, what happens to patients who uh, have this walled up necrosis, which is extending beyond the stomach and the duodenum? Now we have this combined modalities that have come in both the endoscopist and the interventional radiologist have come together. You place an endoscopic lumen of uh, metallic stent to drain the fluid here and in addition you have a percutaneous drain which is placed which can be used to drain the extra uh, 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 the wall of necrosis which is spread beyond the stomach of the duodenum and sometimes it is possible that you are not able to drain with this simple pigtail catheters. We can dilate this tract and go with an endoscope through this percutaneous tract and do this debridement. So these are all the combined modalities that are used to improve the overall outcomes of these patients with the uh, walled up necrosis which extends beyond the stomach and the duodenum. So we have two modalities right now, an interventional radiology which is step up approach and we have an uh, endoscopic step up approach. So now does this mean that interventional radiology step up approach and an endoscopic step up approach that is currently being practiced are these uh, death knell to surgery? Does it mean that there is no role for surgery in clinical day, current day clinical practice? Let us look at uh, the data that is available supporting the role of surgery or minimally invasive surgery. Now I have told you that we have this walled up necrosis and we have this wall of necrosis which extends into the paracolic gutters, into the mediastinum or the mesentery. Now these are the patients, you can see this wall of pancreatic necrosis, these are patients who do very well with endoscopic drainage. Now we have this patient who have this extensive necrosis which extends beyond the stomach of the duodenum and you can see this surgery has been the gold standard. Uh, we use a midline incision and you can see we use a sponge holding forceps and our fingers to uh, do the debridement, make sure that you take out that entire debris and sometimes it is very difficult. You can see this, these uh, very rigid instruments are used to do this necrosectomy. Uh, this is the limitation on endoscopy side. We do not have instruments like this and we do not have, we cannot use the finger during endoscopic uh, intervention. You can use, we can see this, we use a lot of our hand, the finger to take out all this necrosum from the retroperitoneum. And what we do is do a, either we do a close continuous lavage, plan re-laparotomies or delayed closure or we practice this open uh, packing or re-laparotomy. The most commonest procedure that is practiced is the close continuous lavage. This is what it means that you do this entire necrosectomy, you let out all the fluid, necrosectomy and then you put these two drain tubes which are used to irrigate and let out this fluid in the post-operative period. Now whenever we have this patient with colonic communication, obviously these patients require some sort of a diversion procedure in addition to the necrosectomy. Here is one such patient who initially underwent a endoscopic drainage and subsequently shown a colonic communication, did an extensive necrosectomy in addition to transection of the segment of the colon and you can see we have done a diversion colostomy uh, uh, and a feeding genostomy in this patient. These patients subsequently did very well. Now some of these patients who undergo lumen opposing metal stents, suppose if you had done it very early when the stomach wall does not get very well uh, approximated to the wall of necrosis, it is likely that these stents are migrate into the peritoneal cavity like happened in this patient. You can see this, this is a stent which has migrated into the peritoneal cavity. These are the patients who obviously require surgical intervention. This is a stent that is removed, then you do a debridement and subsequently do the course continuous lavage. So what are the outcomes of different surgical open techniques that we practice? You can see this actually these patients who undergo open procedures, the mortality is less than 10% in majority of the series. We have large series published from across the globe which shows the overall mortality is about 10 to 12% in majority of the series and the complications associated with these different open techniques also seem to be very less in the form of pancreatic fistulae uh, or enteric uh, fistulae is less than about 15% uh, uh, in these all these series. So with the advent of laparoscopic surgery, uh, more and more of uh, centers seem to be switching over from open surgery to laparoscopic surgery or minimally invasive surgical techniques. 
there has been a paradigm shift from laparotomy to minimally invasive laparoscopic techniques. Tertiary care centers with sufficient expertise are increasingly used using this minimally invasive technique. And this is documented to show and is associated with lower mortality. Now, when it comes to laparoscopy, it can be the transgastric, retrogastric, retrocolic, or retroperitoneoscopic debridements can be done. All potential areas of collection can be accessed through laparoscopy. Complete removal of the sequestrum is possible and it is augmented whenever it is not possible with pure laparoscopy. We can augment these results using a hand port. You can see this some of these uh, procedures a cystogastrostomy uh, between with stomach and the wall of necrosis. This can be either a stapled anastomosis or you can do a suture uh, anastomosis between the stomach wall and the wall of necrosis and you can do this necrosectomy. These are well documented procedures and if you see literature from across the globe this is associated with success rates almost about 90 to 100 uh, percent from various studies that are reported from across the globe. Retroperitoneoscopy is the other modality minimally invasive modality. Now here the necrosis is approached by direct retroperitoneoscope dilatation of the previous PCD or you can go in directly I will show you subsequently using a trocar and you have this trocar drainage and you can use an operating nephroscope or a videoscope and it can be done even in critically ill patients because there is no contamination into the peritoneal cavity in this patient. Just to show you a uh, wall of uh, pancreatic necrosis undergoing a retroperitoneal approach. You can see this we can using an OptiView trocar here. We have marked the wall of pancreatic necrosis using ultrasound initially and you can see this we are using this OptiView trocar to directly gain access into the wall of pancreatic necrosis in the window that is shown by the ultrasound or the CT. You can see this, uh, it is something like what we put the strokers in bariatric practice. We are putting this into the, directly into the wall of pancreatic necrosis. And once in the wall of pancreatic necrosis, you drain off all this infected fluid, uh, spontaneously drains off. And subsequently, you can put the conventional scopes, get into the retroperitoneal wall of necrosis, and you can have additional ports that can be placed uh, besides this original port and you can have this rigid instrument which can be used uh, to do debridement. Uh, the, the biggest advantage of this direct visualization is that we will be able to avoid some major vessels that transgress this uh, retroperitoneum. Uh, you can see this some of these vessels I will show you. Uh, these are huge vessels that are traversing the retroperitoneum. Suppose if you are doing it blindly it is likely that these vessels get ruptured and will have torrential bleed. And you can use this blunt instrument, the suction cannulas can be used. You can see this, we are going across the vessels, around the vessels. Uh, make sure that you do not damage these vessels, otherwise it can cause massive bleed. And then you do a thorough debridement, lavage of this and then put a drain, uh, two drains in this cavity. You can see this, this is how you do a lavage and subsequently put two drains and come out and then the patient is absolutely comfortable, it can irrigate this. Uh, like what we do in course continuous lavage, we continue irrigating in the post operative period and these patients seem to do extremely well and we have the data from across the globe which shows that this is associated with less than 10 percent mortality and the success rates almost in the tune of uh, 90 percent in this select group of patients. Uh, with increasing use of endoscopy and laparoscopy, now we have this hybrid procedures which are being done in some centers. This is another procedure, minimally invasive procedure, walled up necrosis, you mark it with CT uh, and then you can use a direct trocar. You are going from the abdominal wall, anterior wall of the stomach, posterior wall of the stomach into the walled up pancreatic necrosis and then you let out all this infected fluid uh, using this single trocar. So you can see this your wall and you can use this conventional suction cannula going directly into the walled up necrosis. You evacuate as much as possible and subsequently withdraw this stroker slightly into the stomach and then subsequently use this stapler to create a cystogastric anastomosis. You can see this, you can use this stapler to do a cystogastric anastomosis and once you have created this wide cystogastric anastomosis, this is the biggest advantage of surgical anastomosis because you can create an anastomosis of 5 to 7 centimeters compared to a 2 centimeter anastomosis that is created endoscopically. Once it is created, then you can do this debridement using this either endoscopic or laparoscopic instrument. And at the end of the procedure, we just have to close the one uh, uh, entrot or the gastric wound on the anterior wall of the stomach. And you can see if you compare the different modalities that we have, different minimally invasive techniques that we have in current day clinical practice, 
all of them seem to have equal success. You can see this, the complications associated are almost similar and the efficacy of these almost uh, seems to be same. It all depends on the type of world of pancreatic necrosis and the clinical status of the patient. There are several issues regarding minimally invasive techniques. Uh, this is an emerging modality, be it be endoscopy or interventional radiology or laparoscopy. The data supporting minimally invasive techniques is limited. Uh, there are lack of well-designed trials because of lack of expertise and wide, uh, lack of widespread expertise. There are variations in techniques in different institutions and sample size required to show significant outcome is huge and extension to routine clinical practice has lots of limitations because of the limited expertise and limited technology in different parts of the world. So you can, as I told you, we have this wall of pancreatic necrosis and this necrosis which are extending into paracolligatus, mediastinum or into the mesentery. So now, as of today, the preferential techniques of, for wall of pancreatic necrosis should be decided based on the anatomical location of band, uh, pancreatic necrosis and the extension of this wall of pancreatic necrosis into the other compartment. So you can see this based on this extension, based on the anatomical location uh, current day and based on the expertise that you have, either these patients can go for endoscopic treatment, interventional radiology treatment, laparoscopic treatment or a surgical modality. So these are the preferential treatments that are based on the loca anatomical location and based on the expertise available. But surprisingly, what happens to the complaints? Now we have guidelines, we show that these procedures can be done. But what is the compliance to this medical uh, minimally invasive techniques? There is absolute poor, poor, poor compliance to this minimally invasive techniques that we practice. And the question that is repeatedly asked is, is open necrosectomy still obsolete? Now let us see some data, a beautiful huge data that has come uh, from our own country, from uh, Gangaram Hospital to show that all these patients who underwent emergency procedures you can see this open necrosectomy is still remains one of the primary modalities to treat these patients with wall of pancreatic necrosis with extension. And we have this multi-center data that is pulled up from across the globe. You can see this, all these this authors include people who are involved in interventional radiology, laparoscopy, endoscopy and open surgery. Now we have, this is the practice pattern of 51 hospitals across 8 countries, they have shown in 1980 patients open necrosectomy still being practiced in 1167 patients minimally invasive surgery in 467 and endoscopy in 346 patients so you can see this in spite of the evolution of minimally invasive techniques across the globe in spite of being shown that these modalities can be used because of lack of expertise and because of adequate sub, uh, literature support open surgery still continues to play an important role in the management of these patients with wall of pancreatic necrosis. And you can see this, this is again a beautiful paper from our own country, especially people not in the tertiary care, in primary care hospital where people do not have access to this advanced minimally invasive techniques, you can show this, these patients seem to undergo uh, open surgery with very good results. And if you see what has happened initially when there was uh, initial enthusiasm about interventional radiology and endoscopy procedure. More and more of these procedures were done using this minimally invasive procedure. But with more and more literature coming in, more and more data showing in that there were poor compliance to these procedures, there is more data to show that open surgery still continues to have uh, important role in the management of these patients with pancreatic necrosis. Now let me show you some more data to show this uh, and, uh, uh, randomized controlled trials which are comparing endoscopic or surgical approach for infected uh, pancreatic necrosis. We are comparing an endoscopic uh, uh, step-up approach versus a surgical step-up approach. Now, all these endoscopic patients had good transgastric access, whereas non-endoscopic or surgical step-up patients did not have good endoscopic access. So this is obviously goes in favor of endoscopy. Patients who had an endoscopic step-up approach in good relation to the stomach seem to have done very well. And again, this is another paper which shows open transgastric deprivement and internal drainage of symptomatic non-infected pancreatic necrosis. You can see this, the surgical morbidity, mortality are similar to mini, minimally invasive techniques. 
and this is a beautiful paper which showed different surgical techniques transgastric cystogastrostomy and debridement open procedure cystogastrostomy and debridement and laparoscopic approach you can see this these procedures are tailor made depending on the anatomical location of the valve of pancreatic necrosis and you can see this single stage transgastric necrosectomy is an excellent one stage surgical option for symptomatic world of necrosis in highly selected patient if these patients were to be compared with uh, endoscopic and surgery especially patient with good approximation to the stomach these patients seem to be doing very well and there is a beautiful randomized trial which has come from all india institutes of medical sciences which shows that whenever we have this patient with less than 30% debris you call them sodosis or you call them world of necrosis the efficacy endoscopic and laparoscopic techniques seem to have equal efficacy for internal drainage so this is the randomized trial that has come from our own country again to show that patient with less than 30% debris good approximation to the stomach or duodenum these patients do very well with endoscopic or laparoscopic drainage but whenever the debris is more than 30% or the wall of pancreatic necrosis is extending beyond the stomach or the duodenum these are the patients who would require something beyond endoscopy or transgastric intervention and this is a beautiful meta analysis that has come uh, just uh, very recently now it shows that uh, uh, there is increasing amount of evidence that is coming in uh, the overall certainty of evidence is moderate though there is some benefit of endoscopy over surgery especially in patients who have got good approximation to the stomach and duodenum minimally invasive surgery minimally invasive laparoscopic procedures and open surgery also seem to have a good role so we at our department uh, uh, in our institute have a pancreas board which dis which is constitutes a physicians interventional radiologists and the surgeons who decide which type of procedure patient has to undergo so that we have the least morbidity and mortality in this patient and if you can see this post panther trial when panther trial come in initially there was increasing number of these patients who were undergoing interventional radiology procedure but with more and more data coming in you can see this more of endoscopic ultrasound initially we did not have endoscopic ultrasound and then we had endoscopic ultrasound evolving and endoscopic ultrasound which is stabilized so now we have three modalities an interventional radiology an endoscopic ultrasound and a surgical modality you can see this with increasing evidence we have seen this there is increasing number of patients who are going for primary surgery vis a vis compared to what was done earlier and if you can show our own data you can see this patient going for primary surgery the mortality is very very less compared to patient who come following post post pcd the mortality is higher basically because of the septic complications and the nutritional complications and post eus the mortality seems to be very high basically because again because of the infectious complications and the nutritional complications that we develop because of the delayed surgical intervention that happens in this patient and the overall mortality is about 14% in all this series so you can see this if you select this patients and take this patient for primary surgery be it be laparoscopy or open surgery depending on the expertise that you have these patients seems to do well and we have a select group of patient which do very well with endoscopic and radiological interventions so to conclude this the management concepts of world of pancreatic necrosis have evolved and standardized from conventional surgical procedure i have shown you a lot of data i have to show you how these procedures have been standardized surgery continues to be the standard of care because of several limitations of mis techniques and compliance issues primary surgery including laparoscopy and retroperitoneoscopy are associated with good outcomes with low morbidity and mortality and interventional radiology or endoscopic failures require open surgery because once you do an interventional radiology or endoscopic procedure localization and complete necrosectomy or laparoscopy is becomes difficult you cannot localize this uh, wall of necrosis so for these patients who have undergone an initial interventional radiology procedure or an endoscopic procedure if these patients were to come back to for surgery it has to be an open surgery because laparoscopy is going to be difficult and ir endoscopic failures are associated with increased morbidity and mortality because of septic and nutritional factors and surgery seem to be complementing both interventional radiology and uh, endoscopic uh, treatment so this is a beautiful paper which sums up the practice guidelines of the uh, so i'll just read it with you which shows that 
there are many different interventions in varying states of states of evolution of available for treatment of pancreatic and peripancreatic necrosis these interventions should be offered in the context of optimal intensive care and medical management and that a multidisciplinary approach is required in a center with specialized expertise this is absolutely very very important so i'll conclude and i'll show you the algorithm that we follow this is the best thing that we have to follow now we have a patient with walled off pancreatic necrosis now this is in good approximation to the stomach of the duodenum and if there is less than 30% debris these are the patients who can go for an endoscopic intervention with placement of a lumen opposing stent or a step up endoscopic step up approach now if there is more than 30% debris these are the patients who can go for open or laparoscopic procedure open or laparoscopic transgastric cystogastrostomy these patients seem to do very well now if the wall of necrosis is extending beyond the stomach or the duodenum less than 30% debris these are the patients who do very well with radiology interventional radiology step up approach or these patients can go for open or laparoscopic procedures if the expertise for interventional radiology is not available but if the debris is more than 30% and this patient is sick and unstable it is better that you do a pigtail catheter initially or a radiological step up approach and if it fails we have to go for open surgery if the patient is stable you can take this patient for a radiological step up approach and if it fails you can go for open surgery but if it's stable patient you can either go for an laparoscopic or an open procedure depending on the expertise that is available in the center so this is absolutely clear we should do a good cross sectional imaging uh, bead be a good ct scan or an endoscopic ultrasound to assess the amount of debris one assess the functional status of the patient two assess the nutritional status of the patient make sure that these patients are uh, suitable for uh, any particular intervention a beautiful uh, editorial a beautiful article that was published basically by an endoscopist you can see this if this is what it means actually walled off necrosis absolutely walled off it is like a absolute ripe mango here absolute walled off necrosis in good relation to the stomach or duodenum these are the patients who do extremely well with endoscopy but as the necrosis extends beyond the stomach or the duodenum uh, it is either interventional radiology a surgical procedures that have to be done so that the overall morbidity and mortality in this patient is less so basically walled off pancreatic necrosis is a multidisciplinary approach basically between a hbb surgeon and endoscopist and an interventional radiologist but at the same time it has to be tailored to the anatomic location comorbidities and the available expertise but we should not underestimate the role of critical care uh, intensivists who plays a very important role in the entire uh, uh, duration of admission of these patients so critical care intensivists becomes very very important so it's a multidisciplinary approach between the hpb surgeon endoscopist interventional radiologist and a critical care intensivist and a beautiful article which says together we stand divided we fall it has to be a multidisciplinary approach to manage this patient with this walled off pancreatic necrosis so what about the future i made this cartoon for my department this is what i expect it can happen this could be the least morbid procedure we have this robotic capsule we should be going in make an incision between the stomach wall and the walled off necrosis again this should be suitable only for limited patient do a necrosectomy then use this zipper we used to use this do this zipper laparoscopy before uh, remember some of my own colleague we used to do this uh, used to zip this open and come back and then open this and then do necrosectomy once again and close this zip and this is what i expect to happen in future but till that time the algorithm that i showed you should be the uh, pattern in which we have to follow these patients treat these patients in the intensive care and depending on the expertise that is available and depending on the technology that we have available we have to tailor make these interventions based on the anatomical location and the comorbidities of these patients thank you very much once again for the patient hearing hello uh, sir thank you very much uh, dr jv rao sir that was an, an excellent uh, lecture uh, overall you gave overview of a minimal 
uh, approach for the pancreatic uh, necrosis and ward of necrosis. And uh, uh, I, I saw a lot of uh, slides and a lot of literature, which is again goes in favor of percutaneous or endoscopic intervention in, in necrotizing pancreatitis. So that's an excellent lecture, sir. And you really enlightened us. We learned many things from you, sir. Uh, there's one question uh, from Dr. Akshay. Uh, he is asking, uh, poor complaints is not understood. I mean, there's poor complaints. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, what you said is actually, what Dr. Akshay was asking is very right. See, we have this lot of guidelines, a lot of evidence that has come in in favor of intervention radiology, endoscopy, uh, minimally invasive laparoscopic surgery and open surgery. Uh, unfortunately, what is happening is actually, though, this, though we have these guidelines to show this wall of necrosis is best drained by this method, it is not necessary that that expertise is available everywhere. So what happens is, though we have guidelines that have been set up, though we have evidence to show that this is the best practice for this sort of necrosis, but unfortunately, because of lack of expertise, a lot of technology, that particular this thing is not adapted to. That's what we mean by compliance. So in a peripheral center, like if you say, actually, I've seen that I've shown you the data from our own country in a periphery district hospital. Suppose the patient comes. Obviously, I mean, you cannot try any of the radiological procedures or the endoscopic procedures. Obviously, this patient goes directly for surgery because of a lot of limitations. What you, uh, this is what I mean to say. Uh, when I mean by compliance, I mean that whatever is in the literature, whatever is evidence proved, it is not that we are hundred percent translating into clinical practice. And the basic principles, wherever is in a periphery or is in a center, the basic principles are there is no early intervention for a pancreatic necrosis. Absolutely. Absolutely. So that is the most important. Like in previously, we used to go in early and we have burnt our fingers. There was a bleeding. There are some problems, fistulas. Hence, the later and the least most important. Yes. So there is another question from, again, Akshay. Uh, what is your approach for pancreatic pseudocyst which requires drainage or IR or endoscopy or minimal invasive surgery? Yeah, pancreatic pseudocyst which is in good approximation to the stomach. Most of the pancreatic pseudocyst you are talking about in good approximation to the stomach or duodenum. I have shown you the literature including a randomized trial which has come from All India Institute of Medical Sciences which has shown that be it be endoscopic drainage or laparoscopic drainage, both of them are equally effective. So depending on the expertise, you can do the thing. Or it has also been shown that open surgery, open transgastric cystogastrostomy is also effective actually in all this. So if you have facilities, actually endoscopic option is the first option because hardly any debris pure cystogastrostomy, endoscopic cystogastrostomy is best. Interventional radiology is no for a pseudocyst, which is a good approximation to the stomach and duodenum. Suppose if you don't have endoscopic expertise, I think then laparoscopic or open surgery is the best option. I think the uh, importance here is symptomatic pseudocyst. So if the patient has enough symptoms, definitely needs an intervention. Asymptomatic pseudopancreatic a smaller size, they not need any intervention. Actually, and the other thing is actually also right, actually, initially we used to say that six weeks, six centimeters, the full of six, actually, that does not hold good anymore in current uh, day clinical practice. As yes. Well, it is asymptomatic, we just wait and watch with these patients. Yes, yes. I think that's most important. So symptomatic pseudocyst needs an intervention, not necessarily be an asymptomatic. And suppose the symptomatic pseudocyst in the tail of the pancreas, probably that's what he mean to, yes. uh, he wants would like to know. So in those cases, maybe uh, uh, if the surgeon is an expert, he can do an assistant, trust me. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Are open uh, surgery. I think uh, I think doing an interventional radiology pigtail catheter for a pseudocyst, I don't think it is advisable actually. Yes, sir. Because chance of pancreatic fistula, chance of pancreatic fistula is there. So hence we may not agree. So there is one other question from Devansh. You would like to know what markers would advise for prognostic markers for ward of pancreatic necrosis. So if 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 there is an infection, we have a lot of markers like C-reactive proteins, procalcitonin, all those things. So they only say the, the severity of the disease are, are prognostic uh, uh, stratification of the disease. But exactly to diagnose wall of necrosis, it is an imaging which is most important. 
than these uh, markers. Absolutely, absolutely right, right, sir. Yeah. There's another uh, from Bupendra Mehra question. Congratulations, sir. Very nice presentation. When can when we can do a retroperitoneal necrostectomy without peritoneal contamination? What is need of laparoscopic or transgastric necrostectomy? Yes. Please explain. This is actually retroperitoneoscopic necrostectomy. Absolutely. See, suppose if it is pointing onto one of the uh, flanks, actually, and if you have a good window, uh, if, the, if your intervention radiologists say that they can have a good window, and obviously pointing into the flank somewhere. Actually, these are the patients who do extremely well. I mean, of course, if the patient should be a gallstone pancreatitis requiring a polycystectomy, it might require a second stage. But otherwise, what happens is these are the ones which are absolutely drained well. You can have either, I mean, it is something like the uh, panther trial, like either put in a pigtail catheter, then subsequently do a video assisted necrosectomy, or Suppose we have right now, we have good trochas right now, we are able to go in with the trochas directly and do an echocectomy. These are all the retroperitoneoscopic, but we should have a very clear window and the radiology should be able to mark it very clearly to us. The biggest advantage of this is actually even if you have uh, more necrosum, you should be able to get it out uh, through this small incision that we can make. Yeah, sometimes sir, there will be some pointing, uh, pointing the necrosis in the retroperitoneum, which will be connecting it to the lesser sac. In those cases, probably in a nick and then pass the retroperitoneoscopy and then take out all the necrosum. Yeah. And, and if the necrosum is very close to the stomach, as you mentioned, transgastric uh, yeah. uh, endoscopic uh, necrosectomy. There's another uh, question from Narayan Kabadi. Management of all of necrosis with pseudoaneurysm, with bleed, how to manage? So, shall I answer, sir? Please, please, please. Yeah. So, management of ward of necrosis, sterile ward of necrosis doesn't need any treatment. So, infected ward of necrosis definitely needs an intervention, whatever kind of intervention, say uh, endoscopic, laparoscopic, or percutaneous. If there is any bleed, pseudoaneurysm, and, and the patient has an, usually these people will develop an hypovolemia or shock. So, these are the patients you should suspect a pseudoaneurysm and needs an a, a, a angiogram and better to embolize uh, if you identify the pseudoaneurysm. But if it is bleeding from the smaller vessels, then it's a problem. It's very difficult to identify the uh, aneurysm sometimes. If you identify the aneurysm, it's better to embolize. If not, if the bleeding is continuous and the patient is hemodynamic instability, I think it's better to go in, evacuate and arrest the bleeding. Yeah, absolutely. So, how to get the thing actually, pack the thing actually, pack it up completely, make sure the patient is stabilized and refer into a center where it can be tackled. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, there is another question from Dr. Sheikh. Pancreas is, pancreas is severe pain and amylase lipase is high condition, not stable. So, give your surgery and conservative management. So, I did not understand the question. Probably, uh, unstable patient where the lipase and amylase levels are very high and what to do. That's what I think. Uh -huh. So if the patient is unstable, it means that probably he has a severe acute pancreatitis, wherein he has in an organ failure. It could be a single organ failure or multiple organ failure. So the most important, it's not the levels of amylase or lipase which is most important. And amylase is non-specific lipase also. Sometimes it may be raised in other conditions. So even if this if lipase levels are more than 600 international units, it only confirms that the patient has an pancreatitis. So probably what I understand from your question is severe acute pancreatitis and the conservative management. Yes, we need to identify these patients. We need to put these patients in intensive care management. As you said, sir, uh, the, the important hemodynamics of the patient, volume resuscitation, in terms of linger lactate or in a normal cell, it's a, it's a normal saline, crystallites, give them and then manage, check the urine output, check the blood pressure and uh, check the uh, say CVP and accordingly manage in the intensive care. And I think that's the probably that will be the question. It's not the level of amylase or lipase which matters here. It is an organ failure which is most important to manage these patients in intensive care unit. Absolutely right, uh, Dr. Dupirapa. So I have one small uh, doubt. So uh, you have mentioned endoscopic interventions and successful in 75% of the patients. So in, in I just would like to know in 25% of the patient, 
what was any problem whether the necrosis was quite away from yeah, yeah. this is what happened actually virap uh, this is what actually i keep debating with my medical gastroenterologist what happened was uh, the endoscopic ultrasound came in a big way and all the ct pseudocysts have become endoscopic ultrasound ward ward of necrosis because endoscopic ultrasound detects uh, debris very well yes so, sir so most of the, the moment you see debris it is called as ward of necrosis yes sir so unfortunately what happens is uh, i personally feel most of these things are ct pseudocysts with minimal amount of debris yeah. so when you put this stent obviously majority of them are with minimal debris so they do extremely well you don't have to do anything else yes sir but yes but 25% of the patients for the patient to have more than 30% of debris which is not completely removable so that's what i showed what it means sometimes it get the lumina posing stent gets blocked with the necrosis yeah. and you have to remove the thing or you have to put a nephrocystic vein irrigate the cavity and very rarely it's very small percentage about 5% or between 5 to 10% or one which requires direct endoscopic necrosectomy wherein you go directly into the retroperitoneum and if you have this has to be done only expertise please and then you start doing the necrosectomy necrosectomy but again this is possible only in uh, walled up necrosis that have been good approximation to the stomach and duodenum i think yes, we we all know when we are doing open necrosectomy itself it is so difficult to use a blunt finger and a sponge holder yes sir yes, yes. Yeah. get into the nooks and corners this is very very difficult endoscopically or sometimes even laparoscopically i feel is difficult yes sir yes i agree sir please so this so majority of the ones that are put, uh, on the endoscopic series that are being published most of them yes both of them are amenable to simple placement of stent but a small percentage of them only seem to do require uh, necrosectomy necrosectomy uh, there is one more question from devan sarora uh, would you advise any antibiotic for continuous irrigation post surgery through the drains no this actually those lavage system that we do, we don't use any antibiotic actually actually yeah. you know, normal saline lavage is more than sufficient actually. yeah it's not advised to use any antibiotics through the uh, drains it's not necessary we don't we also do not advise that another question is, is uh, initial stage of pancreatitis cholecystectomy can be performed that's from dr faria from kanpur yeah, i think dr bilap can take it yeah cholecystectomy if it's in a mild pancreatitis well you can do an cholecystectomy in the index uh, admission if the patient has in a severe pancreatitis gallstone induced severe necrotizing pancreatitis we need to wait for at least few months at least months to settle the necrosis and acute fluid collections so then go for an a, a, a cholecystectomy at a later date so mild pancreatitis yes in the same admission whereas severe pancreatitis once the severe pancreatitis settles then we can plan for an a, a cholecystectomy is sir in this kind of patients is an mrcp is a mandatory now yeah this is a very good question actually uh, now in the gallstone pancreatitis whenever we are suspecting gallstone pancreatitis yes based on the thing actually mrcp or uh, endoscopic ultrasound seems to be having a slight edge over mrcp to pick up sludge in the uh, bile duct yes. so i personally feel actually uh, if you have facility we should have an endoscopic ultrasound which and if the patient has cholangitis ascending jaundice we should be intervening these are the clear cut indication but between mrcp and endoscopic ultrasound i am slightly more in favor of uh, endoscopic ultrasound because it picks up that sludge which is responsible for gallstone pancreatitis yeah and uh, another advantage of endo is in elderly patients with comorbidities you can as well do an endoscopic sphincter in not about the same thing yeah. so it's a one time yeah. one stage procedure you can club both the things absolutely yeah. yes i just would like to know sir uh, suppose the patient has completely uh uh improved with conservative management but after 6 weeks we are seen some patients after 6 weeks or 7 seven, seven weeks coming back with again pain in the severe pain in the abdomen not exactly thriving they don't feel like you know having a food they say loss of appetite and we do investigation sometimes there may be some minimal collections so this kind of patients we do get sometimes after conservative management probably probably a disconnected duct or some probably uh, some infected collection i think we need to look so i just would like to know your opinion on this sir yeah these these are just right actually what all, all this ward of necrosis patient whom we are following i mean suppose they come back with severe pain it is either because of some bleed into the ward of necrosis or it could be some infection again supra infection 
or as you rightly said, a disconnected symptom that is responsible for sudden surge and the increase in the size, or it is causing some sort of pressure effect on the stomach and duodenum, which causes it, uh, 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 the patient experiences uh, decreased appetite and nausea. These yes. are these are the patients who require again good cross-sectional imaging and maybe an intervention depending on the type of bone of necrosis. Yes, sir. Uh, there's a question from uh, Dhiraj Kumar. Why don't gastric contents go into the cyst after doing a cystogastrostomy? Very so, see, actually, if you look at this, actually, see, this is what again, this is a <laughs> this kind of debate that we have with the medical gastroenterologists. See, when <clears throat> surgical, actually, I, I think Dr. Bira will agree with me. When you do a surgical uh, cystogastrostomy, the peristaltic wave which goes from the fundus to the towards the pylorus, if you see the not a basic the anatomy of the stomach, uh, when the contractions go from the cardia on to the pyloric side, it makes sure that the defect, whatever trend that you make, it closes. It does not. Yes. yes. The basis. Unlike what happens when they put a stent. There is every likelihood that the food can go into the retro, out into the wall of necrosis. The biggest advantage of surgical anastomosis is that because of peristalsis, it automatically closes and it does not allow the gastric content to go onto the retro. And also in the surgery, once we drain completely and do a sister gastrostomy, yeah. the, the cavity collapses. Absolutely. So automatically, it's the, the, the anastomosis also closes. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. There is another. Uh, Question, sir, you talked about closed drain system. How to monitor them? Ideally, day day to ideal day to remove the uh, remove them. So that is the question. So uh, it's so uh, we actually monitor. We keep a drain. Suppose following in a surgical open necrosectomy, we keep a drain in the lesser sac, one on either side, and irrigate first 48 hours with a ringer lactate or normal saline. So most of the practical problems in this, the muck, whatever, which comes out, it blocks the uh, drains. So so we need to really flush sometimes and then or irrigate uh, the drains. And if, if it's whatever the fluid is giving, it's coming out completely with the debris, then we need to wait for some time till, till the contents are clear. In the content, it's very difficult to say, like you remove after one week or remove after two weeks. It's not that. So we need to see that the output is clear and whatever you give, the content is coming out is clear, there's not much of a debris, and of course, overall clinical improvement. So we, and we, there's we, nothing to watch on the pancreatic amylase, I mean the fluid amylase levels. Yes, sir. Fluid amylase level also is most important. When it's less than a 50 ml, and then, then we might remove the drains. <clears throat> uh, this question uh, some people complain the severe pain in the left iliac part. Is it a sign of pancreatitis? Uh, actually, uh, this could be. I mean, see, some of this could be because of the uh, the pancreatitis that is extending in the left paracolic gutter because that is the path of least resistance. Actually, what is said is absolutely right. Most of the see, if you see, uh, if you analyze the hundred patients with severe acute pancreatitis. You have majority of them which is all of the stomach or duodenum, and some of them, and major the, the next uh, ominous thing is that these patients have this extension into the left paracolic gutter actually. Yes. And it is likely that because of these, uh, the patient will be complaining of pain in the left side. Yeah. There's another question how do you manage the recurrent pancreatitis? So, probably, you mean to say, probably is asking for an either a gallstone pancreatitis or in a, 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 a pancreatitis we had complete recovery and is getting a recurrent pancreatitis. So probably it's because of the one is cholecystectomy is not done in a patient who had a gallstone pancreatitis. Number one, number two, recurrent pancreatitis could be again uh, disconnected uh, duct. So the, uh, the duct is disconnected and the, the, the distal part of the duct is dilated. That's the reason why he's getting a recurrent pancreatitis. Number two, number three, it could be an autoimmune pancreatitis which is not treated uh, completely. So I feel there are three I would like to know from you, sir. Yeah, actually, what is the recurrent pancreatic post-op is absolutely right. What Dr. Birapai said is basically because of uh, the disconnected duct, the distal part dilated, and then you have this recurrent pancreatitis. But if you're talking about recurrent acute pancreatitis, we know what recurrent acute pancreatitis, it could be because of various things. You all know the alcohol, gas, <coughs> drugs, uh, some genetic factors, some toxic chemicals, uh, anatomical uh, 
think uh, things like pancreas division could be responsible. There are some genetic uh, mutations that are responsible. And of late now, I mean, if you ask our clinical, I mean, clinical gastroenterologists to say, they are now, depending on more and more of endoscopic ultrasound, to say that there is some sort of early chronic pancreatitis that they are picking up, which seem to be responsible for uh, recurrent pancreatitis, or we call that a small duct disease and nursery chronic pancreatitis. So this, we have to rule out all this sequentially. Majority of the time, it is basically because of alcohol and gallstones. But if these two are ruled out, then obviously we'll have to check for the parathyroid hormone. You know, to check for the lipid profile. You have to check for the genetic profile. Check do an MRCP to rule out pancreas division. All these have to be ruled out, and if all these are negative, then you do the genetic testing. And obviously, uh, endoscopic ultrasound part forms part and parcel of the workup to see if rule out any early chronic pancreatitis. I have a little uh, one more uh, doubt, sir. Uh, uh, initially, you mentioned is there an indication for an, a, a surgery in the early period, say within uh, one week? So, exceptional. We don't advise surgery in the first week of surgery at all. But are there any exceptions where we can definitely these patients might require a surgery? Yeah, it's very right, Vera. Actually, <laughs> percentage of the patient whom we don't want to intervene uh, than scoping, but the patient clinically condition the patient is deteriorating and he's got some sort of an abdominal compartment yes. so the patient is deteriorating because of this I think this obviously there is increased morbidity I mean morbidity and mortality but a very small percentage of patients even with sterile necrosis may require intervention if they are unstable and they are deteriorating these are the only patients that so, yeah, I think abdominal compartment syndrome initially for data asked. That's why goal directed uh, fluid therapy is very important. Some of the people, some of the surgeons, junior surgeons, they aggressively treat with the fluids. So it might sometimes harmful for the patient because of the edema of the bowel, because of third space loss, they may have an abdominal compartmental syndrome, which can be uh, measured by uh, by measuring the urinary bladder pressures. If it is more than 20 millimeters, millimeters of mercury, all these are the patients needs in a, some sort of an intervention like percutaneous uh, drainage of the, the acidic fluid or they may have uh, some fluid refusion. Sometimes we need to drain them. So or if the patient uh, has some ARDS picture, we need to intervene. So many people ask me, sir, uh, is there a role of an antibiotic as in a prophylactic in a case of a, a severe pancreatitis and there's a necrosis? No, absolutely. No role for antibacterials or antifungals in the initial stage unless and until we have documented evidence of infection. Now, initially, people used to do this FNA to see whether there's inf uh, infection or not, but this is not the current day clinical practice. We don't do this. Uh, I think uh, the only thing we go by clinical uh, uh, condition and also by the cross sectional image. If these two show that there is indication for infection, these, these are the patients who require antibiotics. Otherwise, there is no role for antibiotics. But again, the same thing what we're talking about, compliance, we're talking about, though we keep yes. talking about all this, but majority of the patients, the moment you see the patient, they need the started with antibiotics. Yeah, I think, sir, one important uh, I need to convey to uh, junior uh, colleagues, please do not give an antibiotic. So the moment pancreatitis case has seen, uh, junior surgeons, they start uh, carbapenems and you know uh, they, give, they give for a two weeks, three weeks. It's not necessary. Many, many much literature shows this, shows, uh, shown that there's not much of a benefit from an, a, a prophylactic antibiotic. As you rightly said, sir, uh, prophylactic antifungal also has no role which has not shown. So, hence, there's no need for an antibiotic. So, I should personally thank for uh, yes. came out. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Birappa, for uh, giving this time. Thank you so much. No, sir, it's my pleasure, sir, always. We'd like to learn many things from AIG, sir. <laughs> Thanks to the entire executive of ASI, Dr. Shivram in particular, who is being after us. Thank you so much, Dr. Shivram, the entire executive committee of ASI. We are thankful to the both of us. On behalf of both of us, we, it's my sincere thanks to the entire executive of the ASI uh, for giving us this opportunity to share our views with the surgeons across the country. Thank you, sir. I thank AS and thank, thank you, Dr. Jivira, sir, for giving me the opportunity to chair this session. And I thank uh, uh, Bharat and uh, entire his team for excellently uh, coordinating with us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, sir.